Hello, today I will be reading chapter 10 of The Ballad of Lucy Whipple. Chapter 10, Autumn 1850, in which I, though unwilling, pick berries in the wilderness and am rewarded with a new friend. September came clear and hot, blackberry weather, and dewberry, elderberry, and huckleberry. Why do I have to go picking and not prairie, I asked Mama. She wants to go and I don't. Prairie is only seven. I don't want her wandering alone out there. Mama, you shouldn't want me wandering alone. I'm the one who gets lost and Prairie's the one who finds me. She'll do better than I will. Nevertheless, Mama said, and I knew that I am not Prairie would be berry picking. Each morning I gathered up my wits and my buckets, hid the Count of Monte Cristo under my apron, and trudged away to the hillside off Ranger Creek. The hot summer had dried the grass and turned the oats yellow too soon, but the berry bushes still tangled along the creek. I quickly settled into the work. From late morning to noon, I'd read in the shade of a tree. At noon, I'd eat my biscuits and cold gravy. Early afternoon, yearning for the cool waters of spring, I'd stick my feet in the warm, sticky mud of the creek and read some more. Late afternoon would find me running from bush to bush, grabbing frantically at whatever berries I could reach. And at night, I'd try to explain to Mama why berry picking was going so slow. After several days of this, I reached an especially exciting part of the book, and before I knew it, late afternoon was almost gone, and the first evening stars were getting ready to come out. I jumped up and ran for the buckets. They were full. From a bush came a voice, slow and soft. Don't be scared, Missy. I noted that you took to be running out of daylight before you took out a book, so I thought to lend a hand. Thank you, I whispered, and took off for home. Buckets bouncing and spilling berries all the way, wondering was it elves or fairies speaking to me from a bush the way he, uh, the way the god spoke to Moses. The next day, I looked around a little for tiny footprints or signs of burning before I sat down to read. Morning, Missy, said the voice from the bush. Looks like we're in the same business, uh, hunting in the bushes and me in the creeks. The stranger parted the bushes and looked through. He was no elf or fairy. He was a grown man with curly hair and whiskers, and he was brown, very brown. Not like the sailors from the Sandwich Islands we had seen in San Francisco, browner. He was not an Indian, for he wore more clothes than the Indians I'd seen around Lucky Diggins. Nor was he from South America, like Friday and Robinson Crusoe, for his hair was not long and straight like Friday's. I had never met a brown man before. There were none in our small Massachusetts town. I had heard that the barber in Acorn was the kind of brown man called colored man. Was this a colored man like the barber? My thoughts were so busy I stood stock still and stared. The brown man came out from behind the bush, lifted his pan in a salute, and walked down to the creek, where he swished that pan in the muddy ooze all day trying to wash gold from the gravel. I picked some and then ran home to help Mama make soap. Mama, I said, carrying out a bucket of meat, scraps, and bacon grease. I saw a brown man, a colored man. Mama looked up from the bubbling tub, but said nothing. I could barely see her from the smoke from the fire and the steam rising from the kettle. Why are some people brown? I asked her. Some people are brown like some people got red hair. We all belong to God, Mama said, stirring the boiling fat and ashes in the kettle. Are colored people same as us? Probably have harder lives, but otherwise I reckon so, though not everybody agrees. Some people think what you look like makes you what you are. Mama straightened up and stretched. Only you have to know Jimmy Whiskers to know that ain't so. Such a good gentle heart and such an ugly bear of a man. I saw the brown man every day as I continued picking berries and soon came to trust his soft voice, sad eyes, and kind face behind the scruffy beard. Sometimes he spoke, sometimes not. Sometimes he left me berries or greens, pigweed or miner's lettuce, which I took home for supper. His name was Joe. He sang while he worked, songs full of sadness and longing. What are you reading there, Missy? He asked once. A tale of romance and adventure, I said. Well, nothing would do then but for him to join me. Soon we were both sitting with our feet in the mud of Ranger Creek swapping stories. He told me of Anansi the Spider, Old John and the Devil, and Bro Rabbit, who was puny but smart. Then I would read out loud a spell. He greatly admired my reading and asked all the right questions. Man, what made him do that? And couldn't you tell what a villain he was? Sometimes we shared my noon dinner, but he'd never eat bacon or salt beef. Give me hog and hominy and I'll live in hominy, he said. Pigs is living creatures, treated like things the way I was, and I'll not be eating them. 
I finally got up the courage to ask the question Mama had failed to answer satisfactorily. Why are some people brown, Joe? Good Lord saw fit, and I figure I don't need a better reason than that. Seemed like that was all the answer I was going to get. How did you come here? Not other people like you around. Joe wiped the sweat off his face and his sleeve. I spent all my born days on Mr. Sawyer's place in Virginia. Just Sawyer and the missus and me, and four other slaves. I can never remember any one of my own. Mr. Sawyer, who decides that farm ain't enough for him, and he bring us out west. Near the big muddy, Mrs. Sawyer says, John, I ain't going a step farther and set fire to the wagon. Joe scooped up a mess of muddy water in his pan. What a stubborn lady. They hadn't settled the dispute when she shut up and died of camp fever. He whirled the pan so that the water and lighter particles splashed out. So Mr. St Sawyer bought another wagon, and we come to Patty's bar, miners like thousands of others. At least we five were. Since Mrs. Sawyer died, Mr. Sawyer took to drink and just sat and waved his rifle about and beat us if he thought there wasn't enough dust at the end of the day. Joe picked through the muck left at the bottom of the pan, looking for bits of color. Nothing in that pan. He stooped and scooped up another. One day, a scraggly old fellow on a mule says, Why do you take it? No slavery in California, you know. I didn't know if he was right or if he was wrong, but I saw this as my chance to take off, saying to Mr. Sawyer, you can shoot me, but you can't owe me no more. Mr. Sawyer, who was too dumb and too drunk to know whether this was true or not, just fell off his horse, so I left. Took nothing but this here pan and a pick and a bedroll, figured he owed me for all my free labor. Joe stood up straight and stretched, then stooped down to scoop again. I ain't found much since, just worked tired out claims others have abandoned, but what I found is mine. The belly that gets hungry is mine, and the shoulders that ache are mine, and hands that bleed are mine, and no other man's. I ain't no slave out here. While I'm on my own, I'm as good as free, and being free is everything. His story sounded to me like one of Amos Frog's ballads, coming across the country by wagon, escaping from a drunken master, fleeing alone into the wilderness to search for gold, living as a runaway slave. One thing I didn't understand, what's it mean being a slave? I knew about slaves in ancient Rome, but somehow I didn't think Mr. Sawyer planned to feed Joe to the lions. A slave is a fella who belongs body and soul to another fella, and has to do what he is told and go where he is bid and gets beat if he don't do it fast enough or good enough. Like being a child, I said. Nowhere near, Missy. Children is loved and taken care of. A slave don't even own his own life or his wife or babies. A slave is a thing like an ax or a bucket. Can be bought or sold or killed, whatever his owner wants. Ain't no light thing for a man to be a slave. He threw his pan high into the air and caught it with a grunt. And I ain't one. Not out here. As the nights began to grow cold, I worried for Joe, sleeping in his bedroll on the shores of Ranger Creek and living on nuts and wild greens. Mama, with winter coming, we're going to have some empty beds, aren't we? I reckon, but not too many, I hope, said Mama, who was chopping potatoes and onions for rabbit hash. Could we rent one to my friend Joe? I know we could pay. He's had some luck washing for color. Who's Joe? The brown man I told you about at Ranger Creek. Mama stopped chopping for a minute. Lucy, she said. I can't rent a bed to a colored man. Mm -hmm. All my other boarders would leave. Not Jimmy. Mama commenced chopping vigorously as if she had to make up for that minute of rest. Probably not Jimmy, but everyone else. Why? Because lots of people think colored folk aren't fit to live with white people. Why not? I don't know exactly why not. Scared, maybe. Anyway, Mr. Scatter would never allow it. But Mama, what will happen when it rains and snows and the ice... Lucy, don't pester me. Your friend can sleep in Sweetheart's old shed, and I'll make him breakfast and supper for ten dollars a week if you'll eat it outside. That's all I can do. I went back to Ranger Creek and told Joe, Now that's mighty nice, young lady, but I'll be fine. No, you won't be fine when it rains for ice for days at a time, and you have no food and no fire and no shelter. Be reasonable, Joe. I suppose I could manage ten dollars a week if I traded some of this dust and maybe got me a town job, but... But what, Joe? Spit it out. I sounded to my own ears like Mama. Out here where I see no one but you, I am a free man. But I worry that Mr. Sawyer or some other white man will find me and take me off to be a slave again. A town, even a little town, is too dangerous for me. I best stay out here. You have to come. You've never seen winters like we got here with ice storms and buckets of rain. Besides, I liked having him around. We were friends. I enjoyed his stories and he admired my reading. Not many people admired anything I did. Please, Joe. 
Joe was silent. Then he sighed. Well then, Miss Lucy, now I got me this fine place to live. All I need is a name. I stopped my gleeful hopping and spinning to ask, isn't Joe your name? Mr. Sawyer, he called all the men Joe, so he didn't have to bother remembering who was who. I think I need me a real name that belongs only to me. I thought of the Count of Monte Cristo under my pillow. Maximilian, I said. Maximilian is an elegant name. Joe rubbed his chin. Maximilian don't seem to suit me, Missy. Ivanhoe or Damien or Apazionato? No, seems I don't feel like an Apazionato, thanks all the same. A few days later, when Joe showed up to claim his bed in the shed, I said, I have a present for you. You ain't got no call to get me presents, Missy. Nevertheless, here it is. I stretched out my fist and slowly opened it. The hand was empty. Joe looked at me. It's a name for you. My, my father's name, Bernard. Bernard. Joe rubbed his beard. Bernard. It's a mighty fine name, Missy. A name I'd be proud to carry. Bernard. There's more, I added, sticking out my other fist. A last name. He blinked. I opened my hand. Freeman, I said. And that's the end of chapter 10.